Okay, our next speaker is Max Friesen. Max is a professor of archaeology at the University of Toronto, and he does field work all across the Arctic with a focus on examining drivers of Arctic cultural shifts over the past 5,000 years. And Max has published extensively on these subjects. Notably, he's currently co-editing the Oxford Handbook of Arctic Archaeology. And he's doing some very interesting work now to investigate the degradation of Arctic coastal archaeological sites caused by contemporary climate change. Max's talk today will be on two phases of Arctic climate change, past impacts on human settlement, future risks for archaeological sites. Okay, well, thanks very much for the invitation to this uh, wonderful workshop. And uh, I should start out by saying that this might be false advertising because uh, I may only get to the first of the two phases. <laughs> if, if I tend to go long, I'll just forget about the second one. Uh, but the, the reference is to two very different aspects of climate change that are of concern to archaeologists. Uh, over the last many decades, uh, Arctic archaeologists have, of course, been aware of the fact that there are, there's climate change going on and that it must have had impacts on past human settlement. The other one is a concern that's come up mainly over the last decade or so, which is the destruction of archaeological sites due to modern and future climate change. And, and there's just radical destructive events going on all the time. Um, I have a project myself uh, that's trying to address this that I'll get to in the second half if I have time. Um, but for this first half, I thought for, because of the purpose of this conference, I'm hoping it'll be useful to basically just go through an overview of Eastern Arctic prehistory and the ways in which archaeologists tend to interpret the linkages between the, the big processes, the big events in that prehistory on the one hand, and climate change on the other. Um, so, don't worry about this thing on the right. It's just intended to show you a sort of historical approach. A very important paper, Barry et al., uh, 1977, one of the first that tried to systematically put together uh, evidence for climate change and evidence for some of the big events in, in Arctic prehistory. So uh, just before going into the actual prehistory, I wanted to go through just some of the background. And again, I'm trying to reflect kind of the, the zeitgeist in terms of Eastern Arctic archaeologists and how they perceive climate change uh, archaeology. Um, so archaeology in all regions, but certainly in the Eastern Arctic, is often seen in terms of a series of different cultural groups, different cultures or traditions, if you will, uh, interspersed with big events, like extinctions, migrations, that kind of thing, and, or, or radical adaptations, major changes in the way people make a living. And in this case, I'm going to be trying to look at some of those big events and see whether they do more or less sync up with, with climate change. Um, most of the discussion in the literature is about long-term century or greater trends in climate change rather than uh, interannual or decadal variability. Archaeologists are aware of the fact, you know, in fact, sometimes it's amazing how much variability there is from year to year, and uh, there is an assumption that periods with radical interannual, for example, variability would be very hard in some cases for people to, to live with. But it's, it's hard to sync up the archaeological records and the paleoenvironmental records precisely enough often to put those two together. So usually archaeologists rely more on broad trends of warming and cooling, that kind of thing. Um, and also, there is a lot of regional variability in the Arctic, as you can, as you can imagine. But in this case, uh, I'm going to just ignore that and talk about the, the really big events, the really big processes. So when Eastern Arctic archaeologists, and, and by Eastern Arctic, I'm referring really to the entire Canadian Arctic archipelago, the adjacent mainland, and Greenland. So it's you know, most of the North American Arctic, sort of central and eastern. Um, when archaeologists think about climate change and the potential impacts of climate change, uh, they have a few specific things in mind. And, and much of this has to do uh, with reading the ethnographic record of Inuit, Inupiat, and, re and related peoples. Uh, so I've divided this in a very simplistic manner into increasing warmth and increasing cold. And in cases where we see increasing warmth in the record, there is an assumption, first of all, that there's going to be more open water. More open water has direct consequences, as we know, for uh, the size uh, and extent of populations of many, not all, but many marine mammals 
with whale species being particularly important, whether it's bowheads, belugas, narwhal, or what have you. Walrus are certainly impacted by the amount of open water. Uh, but open water is also conducive to certain types of boat travel, especially uh, travel by umiak, the big open skin boats. And so uh, this nice uh, 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 engraving shows you both a whale, a bowhead whale hunt and one of these big umiaks, uh, which of course with longer open water periods would allow people to move much greater distances. Um, but there's also usually an assumption that there's going to be greater terrestrial productivity. And because there are very few edible plants, the, the relevance to human settlement is in greater numbers, greater population sizes for terrestrial mammals, and especially caribou. Muskox can be important, but caribou is almost always important. Uh, this ethnographic photo show, I, I chose it because it shows uh, 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 this fellow uh, uh, drying caribou meat, and this is yet another aspect of the Arctic, of all Arctic adaptations, if you will, is that there's this brief, highly productive warm season when you have to put up lots of stores uh, in order to basically survive through the winter, with just a, a few exceptions. So therefore, overall warm periods are generally seen to be easier to make a living. They're periods when uh, there's often, it's often considered to be cultural stability, not as much change going on, and also times when human populations expand to take advantage of, of new opportunities. And again, this is a, a simplified version just to give you the, kind of the overview. Now, contrast the increasing warmth with increasing cold. Well, with increasing cold, you get more fast ice, and especially more of that one-year ice, uh, first-year ice that was in a, a, one of the, the talks this morning. Now that's bad for a lot of marine mammal species, but it's extremely good for ringed seals, which maintain breathing holes and which actually can expand their numbers under optimal uh, sea ice conditions. So there's a lot more uh, often ringed seals and sometimes bearded seals, which can also maintain breathing holes sometimes. Uh, it's better for sled transport. Uh, flat sea ice uh, tra travel in spring is to many Inuit the best time uh, to travel. Um, and uh, but overall, cold uh, uh, or, or periods with increasing cold are considered uh, to, to, uh, to lead to, to issues, to problems. These are periods when presumably human populations contract, when it becomes more difficult to make a living, and possibly periods when human societies get more creative and develop new ways of making a living, a living from a particular area of land. Okay, so now on to the general Arctic prehistory. Now, I, I'm just going to try to give a really basic overview uh, and then tell you just some of the big events that, that are thought to have happened. So overall, the prehistory of the Eastern Arctic is divided into just two main traditions, Paleo-Inuit, or it's often called Paleo-Eskimo, uh, the early one, and Inuit, the second one. Now, these are very distantly related to each other. There's an almost complete cultural break be between them. Inuit represents a new migration in from Alaska about 800 years ago that fully replaces the Paleo-Inuit who came before them. Within each of these traditions, there are several sub-traditions or smaller groups. And uh, our, our main, our basic information about these uh, is pretty constant. But some things are changing, and one of the things that uh, the, the, the aspects that, that have been changing recently uh, uh, significantly is dating. We're, uh, our start and end dates for a lot of these things are, are, are changing, uh, sometimes by up to 500 or 1,000 years. And of course, if you want to try to sync up the archaeology with climate, if you start changing the dates of, for example, the first peopling of the Arctic by pre-Dorset people, that can have implications for how it is going to uh, work out uh, in terms of what, what are the local climates, uh, what are the, the, uh, the pulls to draw, to draw people into an area, or the pushes to drive them out of other areas. So I'm going to go through each of these five sort of sub-traditions, if you will, just to give you a couple of the sort of a, 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 a thumbnail version of what's going on, and then turn to the potential for climate to have having some uh, impact. Pre-Dorset, uh, which uh, it's much more complicated. There's multiple names for this, but I'm going with Pre-Dorset, which is uh, used in much of the area. Pre-Dorset uh, originally uh, arose as part of the Belkatch uh, culture in Siberia, uh, migrated into and through Alaska uh, well before 5000 BP, before 3000 uh, BC, and made it into the Canadian Arctic. We now are pretty sure by about 3200 Cal BC, about 5200 
give or take uh, 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 CalBP. That's really interesting because until just a few years ago, we thought it was about 4,500. And in fact, uh, we don't have consistent dates in Alaska that early. There's a couple of dates, but none that early, which mainly has to do with the fact that the sites are just so visible in the Canadian Arctic. If you remember the, the images of those series of beach ridges, I mean, as an archaeologist, you can just basically fly up the beach ridges and see from the helicopter. You can see the the tent rings, you go to the highest one, it's going to be the oldest, you pull a radiocarbon sample out, and ideally it gives you your earliest date. Um, so uh, pre-Dorset are in the sort of southern Canadian Arctic, Arctic archipelago and northernmost mainland by around 3200 uh, Cal BC. And then a few hundred years later, by about 2400 Cal BC, they spread throughout the rest of the entire, the entire Arctic. Uh, these are highly mobile, small-scale people. Uh, most of their sites have only a single or two or three tent rings. There are some much larger sites, but most of them are very small. Uh, most of them have almost nothing in them, virtually no bone, virtually no artifacts, the implication being they're really moving around a lot. So you can have entire regions with hundreds of tent rings, and it could represent a couple of families moving around over several centuries. Well, their, their descendants be moving around as one or two families as well. Large numbers of tent rings and large numbers of sites doesn't have to represent big populations here. Uh, there are, again, a few exceptions, a few very rich sites in this period, especially up, uh, up in Greenland. Um, but for the most part, these are small-scale, highly mobile people. Uh, the next big event in my simplified version is the origin of Dorset, in this case represented by early and middle Dorset. Uh, this happens around 500 Cal BC or a little bit before it. And here we see really a pretty significant change. It's been brewing for a while. There have been some antecedent changes in, in, in the archaeological record. But, but we do get something now that really looks quite a bit more sedentary with quite a bit more elaborate, uh, uh, in some senses, material culture, uh, and in some ways just looks more comfortable. Um, this is a semi-subterranean house uh, I excavated on Victoria Island in the central Arctic, and it's hard, kind of hard to see, but that is excavated about 60 centimeters into the cobble beach ridge. So it's truly semi-subterranean. It's just much more comfortable, I think, in the winter than anything these pre-Dorset people uh, 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 lived in. But just as interesting for housing is that in the Dorset period, we get snow knives for the first time. These are the tools used by recent Inuit for making snow houses, so-called igloos. So this also allowed a whole new set of types of uh, architecture that, again, were both comfortable but also very useful and allowed a lot of freedom. For example, you could now move easily out onto the sea ice to do hunting at breathing holes which may have been harder, if not, but not impossible beforehand. You also get a lot of other kind of what is thought of as sort of cold adaptive technologies. Sled shoes, those go along the bottom of sled runners, so they indicate they definitely have sleds. Probably didn't have dogs. These are probably hand-drawn sleds, but they still would have allowed easier transport than, than not having them. Uh, Dorset ice creeper or crampons, these would have been strapped onto the bottom of, uh, of the, the kamek or the boot to allow extra purchase when you are hunting probably from the sea, sea ice edge. And you get a proliferation of soapstone lamps. So they're burning oil for light and heat now to a greater degree than they, than they did before. So again, a little more sedentary, a little more elaborate, a little more ice adapted. Late Dorset, uh, coming in, uh, this is kind of uh, iffy. Uh, I, I kept playing with which dates I was going to use here. Use here. The earliest late Dorset might be about 600 uh, uh, Cal uh, uh, AD, we're now talking. Um, but the expansion to much of the Arctic is quite a bit later, probably 800 or 900 Cal AD. At that point, you have really a, a very large part of the Eastern Arctic occupied by late Dorset. Most of the margins of Greenland were not occupied by late Dorset, uh, but it, they, they definitely made it back into the high Arctic and there's actually a pretty good, pretty high frequency of sites there, so they seem to have been doing quite well there. Um, their subsistence and their life way is pretty similar to the early and middle Dorset that had come before them. Uh, one of the major sets of differences you get is, uh, is are, seem to be more social and, and ideological. Uh, 
Uh, you get these enormous, very impressive uh, boulder outlined longhouses, for example, which seem to be the, the site of summer uh, ritually charged aggregations that probably happened every year or every few years to, to add uh, cohesiveness. You get a lot more trade in the Lake Dorset period. So both of these are indications of interaction. And uh, just so I could put up a nice sculpture, uh, uh, Dorset has a proliferation of art. There's a lot of, of uh, uh, representation of humans and animals going on, often with uh, skeletal patterns, uh, what may be uh, indications of killing of the animal. Uh, it's very difficult, of course, to figure out exactly what these mean, but there's suddenly an order of magnitude, more of them than there ever had been before in the archaeological record, so something interesting is going on. So that's late Dorset. We now move to this completely different tradition, the ancestors of modern Inuit and Inupiat, uh, the Thule Inuit. This is another one that uh, has just over the last 10 years or so had a fairly radical change in the consensus view of when it happened. And until about 10 years ago, most of us thought that the, the migration, the Thule migration from Alaska into the, the Canadian Arctic and Greenland happened about 1000 AD. Uh, we now think it's sometime in the 13th century, 1200 AD or a little bit later. Uh, not everybody agrees, but, but a vast majority do. And certainly, there's, there's not a big, rich tradition of, of anything Thule before that. So it really looks like it happens around 1200 AD. Um, Thule are Inuit. I mean, everything about their archaeological record is recognizable in the ethnographic record of Inuit. In other words, when you dig a Thule site, uh, all you have to do is open the classic ethnographies from the early uh, 20th century, late 19th century, and every, well, a slight exaggeration, but almost every tool you dig up, you can just see a picture of it and you know exactly what it is, uh, which is handy to have these kind of manuals uh, to identify. Um, but the, the Thule Inuit technology is far more complex. Uh, there's just way more of it. Uh, these people, uh, uh, you know, for every, for every activity, they seem to have invented a new a new implement. They didn't seem to reuse implements for multiple tasks. Um, and a lot of it was heavy. So these people were much more sedentary, much less mobile. They, they had very large semi-subterranean houses with often with deep middens, uh, you know, indicating living in one spot year round or probably for at least say nine months, ten months of the year. Um, this is the, res uh, the remains of a, uh, of a uh, uh, Inuit a Thule Inuit site, the classic whale bone site. These are all whale skulls and whale ribs and, and mandibles uh, used for the, the superstructure. Interesting both to show how, what big elaborate houses they have, but also just to emphasize that wherever they could get bowhead whales, Thule were the master hunters of, of bowhead whales. Um, and the Dorset who had come before them didn't hunt large whales at all. So this was a huge difference between Paleo Inuit and, uh, and Inuit. Um, uh, just briefly, I'm, I'm not going to go through technology as a whole, but just to show you, this is just a small part of marine mammal hunting gear, just to show some of the elaboration. That's a bowhead whale hunting harpoon head. It has a slot that you can't see up here, which would have had a very large slate blade. Two other uh, harpoon head types, a lance used for killing after the whale is disabled. And these rather unassuming things are perhaps the most important, and what they are are float nozzles. So they were put on seal skin floats. The floats were, of course, inflated, put on the harpoon line, and so unlike the Dorset who came before them, they could harpoon a whale, throw the float in the water, the whale would tire itself out, and people were not really put in danger where, as much, whereas earlier people didn't have floats, and it's thought that this one innovation which was developed in the Bering Strait region uh, before the Thule migration was, was a huge factor in the success of, of Thule and Inuit generally. Um, and finally, they had big dog sleds and also these umiaks I referred to. Uh, you can see how many people are in that. It doesn't look terribly safe, I must admit, but you can just imagine how efficient it would be to move a camp with a couple of families and all their gear if you are migrating across the Arctic. And it looks like some parts of the migration, with no exaggeration, happened within 10 or 20 years, all the way from Alaskan homelands up to, up to Greenland and all places in between. So it was extremely rapid. There may have been several waves with accumulating, uh, 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 accumulating populations, but it was a very rapid um, um, uh, process. 
And so that's Thule Inuit, and then there's this kind of arbitrary timeline, uh, you know, moment around 1500 uh, Cal AD, you could put it a little later, put it a bit, a bit earlier, when Thule Inuit sort of developed in situ into recent Inuit. So, uh, of course, when uh, uh, Inuit first encountered uh, Europeans and had their life ways recorded, they were quite different from Thule in many ways. Uh, most Inuit in the Eastern Arctic no longer lived in these big semi-subterranean houses on land. Most of them were now living in snowhouse villages on the ice. Bowhead whaling was rare, whereas earlier with Thule it had been common. Uh, and there's a lot of other uh, uh, small differences as well. So we do seem to see uh, a, a change in life way uh, towards a little bit more mobility, especially in the winter, and changing uh, again to these, these uh, uh, sea ice villages living in snow houses where people are, are uh, um, uh, hunting seals at their breathing holes. And the other thing we see is a contraction of the range. So with Thule, we had at, at, at the maximum, we had most of the Arctic archipelago occupied at least briefly. With the change to recent Inuit, around 1500 uh, AD plus or minus, we did have gradual contraction from north to south. And in fact, this map is kind of generous. There really wasn't very much occupation in, in a lot of this, the northern part of this region. So in fact, uh, Inuit had moved quite far south. And here's sort of a classic uh, case where it's difficult to figure out the causality of why they're moving south. Because on the one hand, if it's getting colder, as I'll get into it in a, in a moment, that may well have been a driving force. But at the same time, very shortly after 1500 AD, of course, we have Europeans showing up with all of their desired trade goods. And it's at that point that Inuit are really coming down the Hudson Bay coast, the Labrador coast. And so part of the motivation certainly was to gain access to trade goods and other opportunities as well. Uh, so it's a, it's a, it's a complex uh, thing. So now I, I, I've probably almost at my time. So uh, this, is, this is the last part of this, this first half. So I'll probably just, just end here. Um, but uh, I'm now going to blithely try to say something about what's the latest in terms of how this dating might actually sync up with, with climate change. Now, uh, uh, I, I will start by saying that you know, my expertise, such as it is, is primarily archaeological. Uh, I, I, I don't do a lot of paleo climate, paleo-environmental stuff myself, although I, I try to read it. Um, what I've done here is taken uh, two, uh, two separate uh, uh, graphs from the Kaufman et al. article that has been cited by a, by a few people, uh, sort of arbitrarily selected, but uh, both to be in the east and to show two different... Uh, uh, proxy measures uh, uh, for, for temperature or for ice conditions. And then I've, I've put the latest information we have on dating up against it to try to see, see how it works out. Uh, on the left, we have the, the uh, uh, borehole temperature reconstructions from two, two sites, one in central and one in southern Greenland. This is, uh, through, the, through a complicated process, bowhead whale frequencies. So bowhead whale frequencies should be a proxy for open water. You should get higher frequencies. These are, these are dead bowheads that have been found on beach ridges, where the beach ridges can be dated and also the bowheads can be directly radiocarbon dated. And so basically, the, the, the more bowheads you get, all else being equal, the warmer it should be. But of course, for an archaeologist, that has the added dimension of if there's more bowheads, if people can hunt bowheads, that's also a draw for, for human migration. So starting uh, at the bottom, uh, again, I think I mentioned that until very recently, we thought that uh, these earliest paleo Inuit had made it into the Eastern Arctic around 4,500 uh, uh, BP. Now we think it's a little, little over 5,000. So in many ways, the further back it gets pushed, the further it gets pushed into Holocene thermal maximum territory, even though the Kaufman article and others are careful to point out just how regionally variable it is, how time trans transgressive it is from from west to east. Um, but for most of the reconstructions, uh, there's a lot of significant warmth going on until around 5,000 or a little later. So it does seem likely that when these first paleo Inuit made it into the, made their migration, made their population movement, that it was somewhat warmer. And because the locations of their sites seem to more or less sync up with areas that should have had big caribou herds and possibly muskox populations, in other words, terrestrial mammals. There could be some 
uh, uh, definite uh, relationship there between the initial move and taking advantage of, of increased caribou populations. Now, this has to be tested, um, but that, that does seem like a decent possibility. The next of those big events, so I'm, I'm just sort of inventing one big event per those five, uh, those five uh, cultural tradition periods I gave you. The next one is the origin of Dorset. Now, Dorset, uh, of all of these... Um, of all of these events or processes, Dorset is, the origin of Dorset is probably the most poorly known and also in some ways probably the most poorly dated. It's probably around here, maybe a little later. Traditionally, Dorset origins have been linked to cooling temperatures and the thought has been that all of those, uh, those uh, phenomena that I, I showed you, the semi-subterranean houses, the specialized technology for ice edge hunting, that kind of thing, uh, snow house construction, uh, may have been linked to an adaptation to colder temperatures. And in fact, with these uh, more recent uh, climate data, uh, arbitrarily selected though they are, it does appear to be syncing up with general cooling, general lowering of uh, 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 or increases in sea ice. Uh, and in fact, you know, the, the actual um, uh, sort of diaspora of Dorset throughout much of the Arctic does happen a little later. It actually happens more like uh, 200, uh, uh, well, 2200 BP, so that would place it near the bottom. So, it, it, again, this is something that holds up as a hypothesis to be tested, that the origin of Dorset could, at least in part, be related to cooling temperatures. Uh, the next one is the late Dorset expansion. Uh, again, that's this group that still looks a lot like earlier Dorset, but they suddenly expand throughout a very large area of the Arctic, including uh, the, Western Arc uh, the Western Canadian Arctic and the High Arctic. And that one actually syncs up really nicely with the beginning of the medieval warm period. It's actually pretty nicely synced, especially, uh, especially because this is another one where I've been kind of conservative with my dating, but I think the high Arctic probably wasn't uh, occupied until about 100 years or 150 years later than this bar would show. A really interesting one, though, is the Thule migration. Now, the Thule migration is obvious, at, again, at about 800 uh, 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 BP, is obviously happening uh, in part during the medieval warm period. What's interesting about it is that back when we thought the Thule migration happened in 1,000 years ago, it was often linked to the beginning of the medieval warm period, and the thought was almost that the medieval warm period uh, expansion uh, of open water and, and bowheads was a trigger for the Thule migration. Uh, now it seems to me more likely that the bowheads had already expanded and the conditions had been there for a while, and that it was probably other factors that set the Thule migration off, maybe social factors back in Alaska, uh, but that once the migration was underway, it was greatly aided by the fact that bowhead populations were at, a, at an almost all-time high um, and were there for the pickens if you knew how to hunt them. And then finally, recent Inuit origins, and again, this date of 500 years ago is totally arbitrary because uh, it depends on the region as to when Thule sort of ends and when, when uh, uh, the, the Inuit pattern of living on the sea ice begins. Um, but it, it's clearly happening either at the start of the Little Ice Age or at kind of a transitional period between medieval warm period and, and Little Ice Age uh, when there's a lot of variability and generally colder temperatures. Um, the date of some of this, especially when some of the major bowhead whale hunting villages is abandoned, does appear to be earlier than the arrival of any Europeans. So that does seem to implicate climate change more than the draw of Europeans. So uh, I guess a current hypothesis would be that cooling climates uh, led to uh, families, groups, individuals starting to try to make wise decisions about what to do. Should they stay? Should they go? Should they change? And once they were on the move or once they were making those decisions, later Europeans showed up and much of their decisions were made in order to take advantage of European uh, materials. But that initially, climate probably did play a role in some of those big changes between, between uh, uh, Thule and, and Inuit. Um, so again, I'm just not gonna bother with this whole second thing because I think I've gone about half an hour. Um, uh, but yeah, I was gonna talk about sites getting destroyed, but if anyone wants later, I, could, I can talk about it or show it or what have you. So thank you for listening and...